My name is Moshe Vardi. I'm the ex director of the Academy Institute for Data and Computation. Yeah. I'm free at last as of September 1. I'm not director anymore. But this is a program that we've been planning since, since the spring, so I'm still uh, presiding here. So we've decided to do something of kind of a little different format. The background for this is partly is the growing recognition of the city of Houston that oil and gas are not going to rain forever and we need to start about some, some innovation. In, you see now there is another conference about innovation I see coming up. We decided to, to do more innovation in Houston. And so partly we are bringing rice alarm that have been at rice and went outside and have excelled in innovation and entrepreneurship and we'll bring them here to rice to tell us about what they have done so we can learn from them. And, and also so the city of Houston can learn from what they have done, usually because usually they've done it in other parts of the country. All these stories, I know people who've done it here, they've done it elsewhere. <coughs> and and we are very uh, fortunate here <laughs> to have with us Walter Lovenstern. And instead of him asking to give a talk, we're going to have a conversation. It's called Fireside Chat. There's no fire here, but yes. we still like the expression. <laughs> The weather. <laughs> and the people I asked to, to do have this conversation with Walter are Sidney Bowes and John Treichler. And all of them got their education here at Rice. All of them went to the Navy. All of them went to Stanford to get a PhD in electrical yeah. engineering. <laughs> it just so happened. <laughs> Must be something in the air. Uh, Sidney Bowes ended up coming to Rice and had a distinguished academic career. He was here at the Dean of Engineering. He is a fellow of the IEEE and, uh, and the AAAS, and he has the John Kilby Medal as a distinguished academic career. John went and started a company and applied, applied Signal, which is now part of Raytheon, and he's still there, the CTO. He is again a distinguished career in industry. He's a member of National Academy of Engineering. And Walter gathered from Rice, went to Navy, went to Stanford with a PhD, and he was one of the founders of Rome. And I won't go more and more about this, because this is really what this conversation is going to be about. So um, we're going to do it that uh, Sidney and John will engage Walter in a conversation. And then at the end, we'll kind of open it up. And we'll let the audience again engage and ask questions of, to understand what partly what Walter has done, but also part of what Rome has done, because Rome is considered one of these uh, what is it called when you have a nucleation point of, of Silicon Valley? Something that starts with the first part of the culture what, what Silicon Valley has become. Without further ado, please. <laughs> you're, okay. You're seeing I'm the senior person here. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, my, what my memory is that uh, when I graduated with a master's degree from Rice, and uh, went into the Navy and then <clears throat> ultimately on to Stanford, that there had been a group of people uh, going from Rice to Stanford for several years, starting off with Burton McMurtry, that uh, you've seen the name of, uh, around the campus. Uh, but then also there was a, a group that, that followed him and benefited from his, uh, from his uh, leadership. I knew, uh, knew uh, Walter here and uh, met him again out in uh, at, uh, Stanford. And uh, the particular group that uh, formed this company, Rome, uh, to me was just fascinating. For one thing, I was delighted to see Rice people so well received at Stanford, but then to see these, these same people succeeded in the world that we, we in education, uh, dream of, and that is we educate people to go out and do something. Well, they were doing it. So I'd, I'd like to start off by uh, asking Walter to say a little bit about his experiences at Rice in that transition out to the, uh, the Bay Area. Okay. Uh, I, I was a freshman at Rice in 1954 and graduated uh, with a Bachelor of Science degree in 59 was a five-year engineering course. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I, and at that time, uh, Bert McMurtry uh, was two years ahead of me in school, and he had gotten a job in California at, at a 
Sylvania's Electronic Defense Laboratory. Uh, he was working on microwave tube generation, uh, developing microwave tubes for them. And also then he started, he came to Rice to recruit engineers for Sylvania. And uh, he, I, he, told, he said, as, uh, I told him I had a two-year obligation with the Navy, and he said, as soon as you get out, out of the Navy, give me a call. We'd like to have you come to work at Sylvania. I did that, and he, gave me, he made me an offer, and the offer was very attractive. I also had an offer for, in Southern California uh, for a defense contractor there uh, because I had some experience in that area. And the thing, thing about Bert's offer was he said, you can go to Stanford for graduate work while you're working. So you can go part-time to Stanford and get a master's degree in double E, and that sounded very attractive to yeah. me. So I, I ended up doing that, and I stayed with, uh, uh, with Sylvania for about eight, year, eight years, uh, getting a PhD during that time. I had to take a year off to write my thesis, but then uh, I got together with three other Rice graduates, and we started the company Rome, R-O-L-M, and I'm the L yes. in Rome. <laughs> What do you have to contribute to that transition from Rice to, uh, to uh, Stanford? Well, mine was years later. Yes. <laughs> mine mine yeah. was years later. Only 10. Only, yeah. only 10 years later. And I had gone to Rice in the late 60s. I spent four years in the Navy. I'm, I'm the winner. They got two years each. Okay, I spent four years in the Navy. And then what to do? I think I'll go to graduate school. Uh, I'll go someplace that doesn't snow. Let's go to Stanford. So that was, the, that was the thought process of my highly sophisticated career planning. Uh, I got out there, I did go to graduate school, but in, in flipping back over to Walter in just a second, it's fair to say that when I got there in 1974, a couple things. One is 1971 is the first time the phrase Silicon Valley had ever been used. It showed up in a piece of marketing blurb. So when they started their company, it wasn't even technically Silicon Valley. Right. Okay, the second thing I want to point out is that uh, all, uh, a, a marketing flack for one of the semiconductor companies. It was just a little, and everybody said, that's a catchy name. Silicon Valley used to be called the Valley of the Heart's Delight. It was the Santa Clara Valley. It was Santa Clara Valley. And yeah. they, all the fruit and walnuts and all that sort of stuff. So agriculture was what they did. Okay, and some microwave tubes. Yeah. Okay, that's, <laughs> right. that, that was going on too. Okay, but uh, they'd actually started their company before it was technically Silicon Valley, and what we'll come back to later is the kind of company they set up is the company that to this day companies in Silicon Valley model themselves on. So uh, it was the place to go to work, and I was too dumb to do that, so I went to graduate school instead. Mm -hmm. And uh, so why don't you talk about how y'all decided to do this company and, and what you had in mind as the... Okay, make, make I, might, I might talk a little more about experience, my experience at Rice sure. please, and, please. and the other founders of the company because we were very close. Uh, they were about three years behind me at Rice and uh, it was a tough school then. Uh, <laughs> Unlike now. <laughs> Piece of cake. I, I, I'm sure it's not easy now, but uh, believe me, <laughs> I believe it was tougher then because it was one of those times where uh, for freshman orientation, they said, look to the left of you, look to the right, because one of those people are not going to be there to graduate with you. And they, they truly flunked out a lot of people. But I think that was because it, it, the, the, it wasn't as difficult to get to Rice. And so maybe a lot of the students weren't quite up to the standards that Rice set for it for its students, and so a lot of people did flunk out. And, you know, it wasn't a good thing, but, but for those of us who survived, <laughs> uh, we, we learned to work hard, uh, as I'm sure you are, uh, but because you have such uh, strong competitors uh, now. Uh, at any rate, I think that prepared us for, uh, for what we accomplished. Uh, and now, to get the, get the about about getting started, um, 
I had decided, uh, I, my father had started a small company, not really successfully, but I, uh, so I knew something about starting a company and I liked it. It was kind of interesting uh, and decided, I think I want to start a company. Uh, and so even as I was uh, doing classwork and what have you, I did have them in the back of my mind, I want to start my company. It turned out with Sylvania, I was in a group that was looking at opportunities. Uh, at that time, Sylvania was doing, uh, the Electronic Defense Lab was all military hardware. What, what happened to Sylvania? Uh, they... Um, bought by GTE. Yeah, GTE, &E, that's right. GTE &E bought the company. It was it still maybe a division there, of GTE. Still there, in Santa Clara now. It's, yeah. it's not where it was when you were there, but it's, yeah, it's still in Santa there. Clara. Yeah, uh, and I, I was there when GTE &E bought it from Sylvania. Uh, and so where was I? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I was always thinking, even in Sylvania, I wanted, kind of wanted to go into production. And they said, no, no, we want you more in theory and learning how to, and, and You're helping us build equipment. You had a PhD for heaven's sakes. Use your PhD. Yeah, they, yeah, I had a PhD. He said, you don't want to know about production. So. <laughs> uh, but I, that didn't matter. I, so at one point I, I hit upon, I was looking at a new venture group for what was in GT&E uh, to diversify out of the military into civilian uh, applications of their technology. And I, I ran across a, a, an idea that I liked uh, and I took it to the management and the management, uh, a fellow had a patent, and the management said, no, we're not interested in it. Well, I got interested in it, and so on my own time, I was kind of talking with this guy, and I thought, you know, I think I can start a company based on that patent. And so I decided I was going to go out and raise some money from people, uh, and, but I knew as soon as I went to someone to raise money, they were gonna come back to the company and ask, what kind of a, uh, an employee I was. So I thought I'd better notify my, my, my supervisors that I was gonna be, start looking for money for this company. Well, as soon as I did that, they didn't like that. <laughs> they didn't like that idea. They said, look, either you work for us or you don't. And I said, well, look, you know, I'm th just thinking about it and on my own time. They said, that doesn't matter. You, you can't continue this looking for money to start a company. And they, they said, either you're with us or you're against us. Against, as they say. <laughs> and I said, well, uh, you know, I think I quit. And they said, <laughs> you're fired. <laughs> you I, agreed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I, I think you know that phenomenon now in the White House. They're having the same issue. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes they get fired, sometimes they quit. It was sort of the same. <laughs> At any rate, I, I quit. I started looking, uh, trying to raise money. Had a very difficult time because I had very little experience, about six years of experience with very few employees. I, had, I managed at most five employees at one point in time. And so, and PhDs were kind of not they weren't thought about for starting companies. And so that was, that was a strike against me. Uh, so, I was, so I was having trouble and then I got a call from Ken Oshman and Ken said, I hear you're trying to start a company. And I said, yes I am. And he said, well why don't we do it together? And I said, oh that's a great idea. So I got together with Ken and then he recommended we get together with Gene Richardson uh, who uh, he knew from from Rice. I'd known Ken from Rice and Ken knew Gene and then Bob Maxfield. He knew Bob So then the four of us got together and we were kicking around plans of things to do and then Gene Richardson had this great idea because at that time there were no personal computers. There were most, there had just started to be smaller computers which were called mini computers. Something between PCs and the big standalone uh, CPUs. What year is this? Uh, this was 1968, and and w uh, the, th the three of the four of us had been doing military hardware, 
And Gene said, well, you know, the, the military is going to need a computer, uh, a smaller computer, whereas uh, there, were no, there were only big computers, and the military usually went to IBM uh, or uh, Univac, some, some big companies to build computers and do all the software. And Gene said, no, I think if we do an off-the-shelf computer, if we take a commercial computer, one of these new mini computers, because there were only 200 integrated circuits. Well, that was, a, that was pretty small compared for that time period. We can make a military computer that's small, compact, and that will run all of the commercial software. And the software was the big issue for the military. They were paying, <coughs> paying millions of dollars to develop new software suites for these specialized computers. So and was DEC in business at that time? Uh, DEC was in business, and a very interesting question, because uh, there was a spin-off of DEC was Data General. Remember Data General? Those were the guys at DEC who said, why don't we do a 16-bit machine? And DEC said, no, we're not doing a 16, because our 8-bit machine is selling very well. Sorry, we're getting into the weeds. <laughs> getting into the weeds here. Mm -hmm. But we, we've settled on the Data General, their new Data General Nova, which was their first computer. And since they were new, uh, we negotiated a license agreement with Data General to do the military heart of business. And they said, but we had to agree not to sell commercial computers, mini computers. And we, we did make that agreement. And they got 5% of our company. And so that's kind of the, a quick summary uh, from here to there. And we what, did. What, were you, what was your, uh, had you kind of divided up responsibilities among the four of you? Yes. What, what, yes. what at that point in time, what, what was your role in it? Uh, another good question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I was up. Uh, well, more importantly, <clears throat> when we first wrote our business plan, Ken Oshman wrote the business plan. And he wrote in as he's president of the company. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I said, wait a minute, Ken, who made you president of the company? Mm -hmm. And he said, well, I, I think I'm the president of the company. I wrote the I know, document. <laughs> yeah, I know what I'm doing, and yeah. I know how to run this company. He had less experience than I had. <laughs> But, but, you know, I was a conflict of order, so I said, well, okay. So, well, basically, it started out that Ken was president, Bob Maxfield and I were the engineers, and then uh, Gene Richardson was marketing. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of how we started. And then it uh, turned out Gene, uh, Bob Maxfield is a much better engineer than I was, and so I moved into marketing and the sales. Mm -hmm. So it ended up with <clears throat> Ken as president of the company, Bob Maxfield, uh, uh, in, uh, engineering, chief technical officer, and, and I was marketing, and Gene Richardson had quit. Mm -hmm. So it, basically the three of us uh, did the company long term. So Gene, who originally had this idea, yes. ended up being the first one to, to, to quit. To, yeah. <laughs> but he did so okay he, because he had uh, a percentage of the company. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So he, he did financially very well. It was very unfortunate because he's a, he's a really brilliant guy, but he only liked to sell to smart people. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> I, I'm very serious. I'm serious. That's a you small know, market. He, <laughs> yes, it, it, it turns <laughs> out it's fairly small. <laughs> and, you know, a lot of... People, not that they're dumb, but they, you know, they don't have the technical capability that, that Gene liked. Mm -hmm. So if you didn't have a lot of good, deep technical capability, he couldn't sell our computer to you. <laughs> it just wasn't possible. So he, he was frustrated. And you, he, on the he other hand, quit. didn't sell anything, right? <laughs> I, I was willing to sell to anybody who, who, <laughs> thought, who I thought could use our computer. Yeah. 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 They didn't have to be smart. <laughs> they didn't have to understand what the computer did, uh, you know, yeah. uh, from a technical standpoint, if they needed it, and I could explain to it how it would solve their problem. I was happy with that. Well, how come you didn't have a, 
a, somebody with, who had uh, got a business degree uh, in your original group? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't, you know, we were, we were typical engineers in that, that we thought that if we built a product and it was a good product at a good price, people would buy it. We, we, you know, we knew nothing about marketing and sales. And so we were, we, we were such... But you say Ken uh, wrote a business plan, so you, yeah. you had a business plan. Well, Ken, Ken did know business. Yeah. Ken, Ken did, even in spite of the fact that he hadn't worked very long at GT&E, uh, he had, in, in his high school time period, he had bought and sold cotton in the fields mm -hmm. outside of Houston yeah. uh, uh, as a broker. So he knew, he knew business. He, he, had done a, he had done business. And even, actually even, uh, even Gene Richardson, he had bought baby chicks uh, uh, in high school. And, and sold them at Easter? And, 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 and sold, <laughs> uh, sold the eggs. He, he, he had a whole egg business. Oh, Lord. So, you know, that was kind of the extent of our business. Hey, there was no, McDonald's to, there was no McDonald's to work so, for. Right? So we, you know, we, we, didn't know what we, we didn't know what we didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> but it, you know, yeah. many, many companies start like this, but at some point it grows and they say, oh, we need yes. some own business. Yes, yes, so and we did, point, we did, and, and we hired, yes, we did, we did hire some very significant business people. Leo Chamberlain was one who, who'd been successful, uh, and uh, to another fellow who became our chief financial officer. Uh, Leo became head of marketing and sales. And, uh, and yes, yeah, so we did, we were smart enough to understand when we, when we kind of ran up to a lot of problems that we knew we needed help and it had to come from somebody else. T tell so, them how yeah. successful your original business plan was in raising money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, originally we did a business plan where uh, we had a lot of good ideas. Uh, we had, uh, we were going to do uh, vehicle location. We got some uh, crypto, cryptographic, crypto, cryptology kind of thing to have secure voice communication. This was just not practical in 1968-69. There was no such thing, uh, and we were going to develop this uh, from scratch. Well, nobody wanted to give us money based on these various ideas that we had until Gene hit on this idea of the militarized computer, and then one uh, financial guy who had come from Hewlett Packard uh, said, I like that idea, I'm willing to help you raise the money to start your company. Uh, now did, did you go after venture money? Oh yeah. Well, we talked to a lot of venture capitalists, and this fellow, uh, who had started a division of Hewlett Packard called Mel Labs. Uh, he actually had a fund, uh, a venture capital fund at that point. He was a venture capitalist. But most of it, got turned, we got turned down by ve every venture capitalist around, and there weren't many in those days. It's not like today where there, there's so many venture capitalists. There, there were only a handful uh, of venture capitalists. And, and we got turned down by all of them, except one. <laughs> and, and, and we did well. Well, well, the reason I asked him this question is, <clears throat> when we started our company, a long time later, decades later, okay, it was 1984, yes. okay, uh, same thing. We had this idea of something we wanted to go do, but it turned out that it didn't sound like a commercial product. The venture capitalists just couldn't understand it. And, he, and you had a PhD. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah, fortunately I was the only one, so it didn't completely screw things up. <laughs> okay, but uh, another thing was that they all wanted 90% of the company because these things are risky, and venture capitalists, in yeah. order to make everything work macro, really want most of your company. And we had this foolish idea, just like you guys did, okay, that, because we learned it from you, Okay, that cutting the employees in on the potential gain of the company was a great idea. So you wanted to keep enough stock so that you could actually give some of it, give, sell, option, whatever verb you want to use, to your employees as part of the 
hire them, retain them, make them great. And so <laughs> we had to do the same thing you guys did. We mostly, we had to kick in money ourselves to get it going because yes. a venture capitalist yeah. wouldn't under terms that we found acceptable. So, uh, and I, I, should, I should expand to say that there were, he's gonna tell more about it in a minute, but there were two companies, exactly two, in the Bay Area that everybody modeled themselves on. Okay, first of all, starting back in 1939 was Bill and Dave. Does anybody know who Bill and Dave were? Hewlett and, Hewlett and Packard. Hewlett and Packard. Okay, so they built this company that was impressive, technological, product driven and all, had good management skills and so forth. And so if you wanted to go be a good engineering manager, it was a place, great place to go to work if that's what you wanted. But these guys basically took it to a new level in terms of orienting the company around hiring and retention of the best staff you possibly could. That's true. So we, you want to yeah, talk we, a little bit about that? We built on the Hewlett. We, 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 were, we were after Hewlett Packard and before Apple. It was kind of time-wise where we were. Uh, and like I say, computers went from these mini computers to, of course, personal computers that Apple did. Uh, and, and the guy who funded us, Jack Melkor was his name, uh, Jack had been a, a, a vice president at Hewlett Packard. And so we, we used Hewlett Packard as our model of a company that we wanted to have. And I'm sorry, I have a little emotion about this. <laughs> uh, and so we sort of took it one better. Uh, we were the first people for instance, to have recreational facilities uh, on, uh, with the company. Uh, what, ha what happened is an interesting story is uh, as we were growing, we were doing well uh, in the military computer business and then we, we diversified into the telephone business and uh, we were doing pretty well but, and we used to have these uh, Christmas parties and they were becoming kind of elaborate and expensive and we looked at financially uh, that it, if we took the money that we spent on Christmas parties, we could, we, could, uh, we could build a building that had a gymnasium and a swimming pool for the same amount of money. We could, bar we could borrow the money. What a party, yeah. <laughs> you're well, thinking. And so actually we had about 300 employees at that time and we had a meeting of all the employees and said, look, which would we rather have, a uh, Christmas party or a uh, recreational facility? And we said, we don't know exactly what that is, but here's some of the possibilities. And of course, they all voted for a recreational facility. <laughs> well, you know, they, rather than a one-time party every year. And we did that, and we were the first to do that. We had a swimming pool a lap pool on, uh, on campus, uh, and a gymnasium, a uh, racquetball court, uh, sauna and steam baths, and uh, employee... Google invented that, but obviously... No, no, huh? I, no, not only did Google not invent it, and the other thing he points out, or didn't point out, is they also had to put in place a flexible hour structure, because every company there was eight to five and lunch was now, they introduced flexible hours so you could take advantage of these facilities. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and we had so, no time clocks and, you know. <laughs> uh, our, our only criteria was, can you do the job? Did you get the job done? If you spend an hour or two in, uh, swimming, that's fine. You know, as long as you can get your job done. Uh, and no, you know, no hours, you mm -hmm. come in early, go late, whatever. Uh, so we had flexible hours. And we, we actually set uh, as a philosophy to have a company that was a great place to work. And I think we were. You did? We were the first to do that. How, how many yeah. did you get? How many we, en we ended up, uh, eventually we sold the company to IBM for various reasons. Uh, and we, we had 10,000 employees and a, almost a, a billion dollars in sales, but that was a billion dollars in 1985, which today is five or six billion, I think. So 
So is the Silicon Valley culture of, of yeah. goodies for employees started with ROM or with HP? It started with HP, with HP. Uh, the, the positive employee, uh, you know, giving stock options to employees, having a stock purchase plan, really started with HP, but then we expanded on it. Uh, and we think it, and you know, Hewlett Packard had a, a philosophy of walk around management. D uh, David Packard and Bill Hewlett used to walk around the facility and say, what's going on? Can we help you? Anything you don't like? And so we kind of had just expanded on that uh, and made more of it and better. And, uh, you know, a cafeteria that served good food at, at low prices wasn't free like Google, but uh, almost. It was, it was so good we used to have people walk in off the street. <laughs> I mean, you know, local companies, would, they would come over because the food was cheaper and better at our cafeteria. Uh, so we, we have finally had to do badges. We didn't like badges, <laughs> but we finally had to do, identify employees from non-employees. Uh, so we tried to be as, as, as unbureaucratic as possible. We help people to say, you know, look at the problem, solve the problem. On the, on the academic side of things, yes. uh, what courses uh, particularly served you well and what courses uh, did you not have that you wish you had had? When you're looking back at yeah, both Stanford and Rice, but particularly at Rice, uh, yeah. what do you wish you had had that you didn't have? And what did you have uh, that kind of gave you a leg up or made you feel uh, very good? Well, uh, I guess the main problem with Rice at that time for electrical engineering was that uh, electrical engineering was uh, what we, what we were taught primarily was electrical power, electrical generation. So we had <laughs> AC and DC machinery. You remember that well. Oh, yes. That, you? that, that explains you. <laughs> and we had one electronics course. Yes. Right? And it was a fabulous course. Who taught that? Who? Uh, Graham. Marty, Marty Graham. Marty Graham. Yeah. Uh, uh, who, who's? Mar Marty Graham was great. Yeah. Uh, and he because uh, uh, transistors had just been invented, basically, and uh, integrated circuits started uh, when after we graduated, mm -hmm. actually. Yeah. Uh, there were, and Marty Graham taught us what to do with a transistor, how to make an amplifier, how to make an oscillator, you know, just real basic stuff, but he, he was such a good teacher. Mm -hmm. That, you know. Well, and that's when I, I first, is from, from Marty and back in, the, in those days, yeah. began to appreciate the difference between an education and a training. And we got an, an, an education. And so moving from transistors to, uh, from tra vacuum tubes to transistors and then to integrated search was no big deal. Yeah. But the people who'd been trained couldn't make that transition. And I think, ha, huh, that's interesting. And uh, Rice had been an education even when they were teaching power. Yeah, even though we were <laughs> learning how AC and DC generators <laughs> work. Yes. Uh, and AC and DC motors uh, and field windings mm -hmm. and things like that. Uh, you know, we learned it. We learned mm -hmm. the, the process. Mm -hmm. And I think that was what was important. Not so much which courses we took yeah. or didn't take. I mean, it would have been nice to have some more. I, there was one semiconductor course on how it worked with PNN junctions, but that was more physics to me, and I, I, I didn't really grab much of that. <laughs> that, didn't, that didn't get me, but, but Marty Graham's course in how to use a transistor. Well, what about courses like in business? Uh, do you wish there'd been some business courses as yeah, part of engineering? Yeah, of course, that would have been yeah, useful. At the expense of something else, though. Yes, maybe we'd have known a little more about what to do <laughs> starting the company. Uh, but I'm not so sure that it made much difference. Uh, you know, we, we were, I have to tell you, as we started our company, we did hire some business majors, but we did not hire business majors directly out of school. We would not hire, at, at yeah. first, uh, we would not hire a business major direct who had not had some real experience uh, in the real world. 
And so we wanted to see a couple of years of, of experience of someone who had a business who had a business degree but had spent a year, two, three years in the real world uh, in industry. Uh, then we would hire them, uh, and we did that. And we hired many graduates of Rice to the point where we were getting a little worried that we looked like a Rice mafia yeah. <laughs> uh, at, in the company. Uh, but we always found that, that they were the best. Yeah. <laughs> I'm curious about one thing. You mentioned earlier today, actually, when we talked. Yes. How important is luck when you start a company? Oh, is, you know, I mean, yeah, good. How much is dedication? How much is luck? Terrific question. Absolutely. 95%. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, and Ken Oshman proved it. I tell you how Ken Oshman, Ken is the smartest guy. Ken and Bob are the two smartest guys I've ever met. And Ken was probably the best businessman I've ever met. And Ken decided when IBM bought our company, he was going to start another company and do as well with it as he did with Rome. But you know, he couldn't do it. Uh, he took the smartest people that he could find. He still couldn't do it. So believe me, it's luck. We happened, we got the right people, the right time, the right products, and, and we, were, we were just very lucky. Uh, the, the military computer turned out to be the right timing and the right product. It was hard because the government's hard to sell to and uh, because <laughs> they already are comfortable with the suppliers they have. They're not the smartest people in the <laughs> And they're not the smartest people in the room. <laughs> that is Jeff Jean. Okay, there's, some who, there's some who are. There's yeah. some exceptions of, in the military who are very smart people, but by and large then. How do you, very, many, very often small companies have a hard time coping with, with fast growth. Yes. Because it means you're changing very, very quickly. The nature of the company even changes very Yes, quickly. yes. What was it like for you guys? Well, I, I have to say that that, not, that was not an area that I had to deal with because by then I was in, Mar I was, most of the time I was living in Washington, D.C., selling to the military and also uh, lobbying in Congress to break up AT&T uh, because that AT&T was our major competitor uh, in the telephone business and uh, so you know I, I, I guess I really can't address that. You'll have to read the book. <laughs> it's in the book. Yeah. yeah. This is a, an interesting, uh, very interesting book that, that I would strongly ad, uh, advise that all of you, whatever your interest in, in uh, startup companies, uh, to, to get uh, the book uh, Inventing the Cold War University and get this book because the, the other book, Inventing the Cold War University, carry, it goes from about the 1940s up to the so maybe 70 or something. This picks up with Rome and takes Rome up through uh, almost current times. So uh, with those two books, you can get a good picture of Silicon Valley and, and its predecessors. This is purely Silicon Valley. The other book is more uh, Stanford. But uh, this is written by uh, uh, Kathy uh, Maxfield, uh, the wife of, of uh, Bob Maxfield, Maxfield yeah. uh, the M in Rome. And so she's got access to uh, an important source. Well, and she worked at Rome. She was a marketing manager. Uh, oh, for yeah, a number of years. Yeah, for a number of years at Rome, before she married Bob. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, anyway, it's a, it's an interesting book uh, in that uh, certainly a lot of the history is interesting, answering some of these questions about how we dealt with growth and. Uh, what was what was the trajectory? Can you tell us a little bit of the trajectory? Yeah. Okay. Well, it's a good yeah. question. I, I and incidentally, we, we probably want to open it up for questions yeah. from like the we're rest here. of the people. <laughs> uh, but uh, with the military computer, uh, it was it's kind of a slow start, but we sold one or two, and then we got in with we found a smart guy mm -hmm. uh, in the army who was. Uh, uh, civilian buying military equipment for the army. He liked the idea and basically for his group standardized on our computer. So we ended up selling 
uh, at the computer, we, we started out with our first year sale was about a million and a, and a half, and we grew about 30% a year for the first three or four years before we started the telephone business and with, with profit. We were profitable uh, after our third quarter. We became profitable. We stayed profitable the whole time. Uh, and in those days, you had to have five quarters of profitability before you could go public. Nobody would take you public if you didn't have continuous growth and five quarters of profitability. And we qualified for that. And we actually went public in 1975, I believe. Uh, and, but then we hit on this idea. We were, we were concerned about the military market uh, that we, and we wanted to diversify and use our, our computer technology. And we could see that the telephone, telecommunications was moving toward digital data. And so we built uh, uh, a, what was called a private branch exchange, PBX. We called it CBX, Computerized Branch Exchange. Is It was a switch that was on the premises of, of businesses and controlled all the telephones inside of the business. And we were competing with AT&T in this. And then our, our growth suddenly took off. And we started doubling every year. Uh, 5 million, 10 million, 20 million, 40 million, 80 million, 160 million, until finally we're at a billion dollars when we sold the company to IBM. And prof always profitable. If I can add something about that yeah. uh, perspective, I know where you're probing, and it's a really great point. So if any of you have entrepreneurial ambitions, I want to let you know something. There's a rule of decades, and let me tell you quickly what it is. And unfortunately, it's a tricolor rule. It's not written down anywhere. <laughs> and that is, that is there's a, the, if, if you look at managers, there's people who can manage five people. They walk around with a piece of paper in their hip pocket, and they can touch the other four, and they get certain things done. And arguably, it's the most very efficient model Okay, and then there's the rule of 50, which is the most that a single person can actually totally micromanage to make sure the work is perfect. Okay, and any more than 50, they, they flame out as a manager. Then you get up to 500, and there's a set of skills required for that, okay, which are different than these skills and these skills. And then there's 5,000. And so it isn't just a matter of getting all the cash you need to grow the company and building all your distributors and manufacturing. You actually need to go through generations of management style in order to be able to run companies that are become orders of magnitude bigger before your very eyes. And as much as Rome is famous in the Bay Area for setting the model of a good place to work, which now every company, including mine, tries to copy, okay, this idea that this, this other aspect in which they were wildly successful was actually being able to, to, to take this growth and actually go with it. Yeah. That's very unusual. Most companies flame out for lack of management ability. The founders want to hold it tight. They didn't raise cash. They go broke because they didn't get cash. And so there, it wasn't just luck. That's what I'm it's, trying to say. Yeah, you have to credit Ken Oshman and Bob Maxfield for that <clears throat> We can do that. Yeah. They're not here, yeah, but we can do that. Yeah, they were... <laughs> I think most of you know that the Ken Oshman, the Oshman family, is uh, the funders of the uh, Design Kitchen. And uh, also that family is related to the Oshman Sporting Good family, so that there's, they're good in the business world yeah, yeah. outside of technology yeah, as Ken, well. Ken was a uh, poor cousin. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> the Oshman family was prominent yeah, in, in Houston. Houston yeah. Yeah. But Ken lived in Rosenberg, yeah. <laughs> uh, how many, 40, 30, 40 miles, 50 miles outside Houston, and he was kind of the poor cousin. <laughs> hey, Brazos, bottom yeah. land, selling cotton. I mean, yeah, selling selling cotton, exactly. He was in the countryside selling, buying and selling he, cotton uh, 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 horseback. Yeah. Okay, uh, I, have, I, have a, I have a question for you since nobody else has asked it, and this is something we're discussing at lunch, so I'm cheating, and that is, okay, uh, you got to Silicon Valley in the 1960 and grew a company, sold it in 1984, which still right. pro proceeded. I got out there a little bit later, also started a company. A question that gets asked all the time, is there anything special about Silicon Valley or is this something that actually can live in Houston? Is there, is there any fundamental difference between what we did yeah. you know, and what Houston is capable of? 
Well, I think first thing uh, uh, is something that we talked about was uh, uh, the, uh, Stanford had an honors co had a program where you could you could work and and get a, a a master's degree at the same time in engineering, and that was very attractive to Rice graduates, and that's how Bert McMurtry was was able to attract so many uh, Rice graduates to come to California and, and do graduate work at Stanford. Uh, uh, additionally, wait, where was I? Um, oh, also, and in starting a company, uh, all of the, the things you needed to start a company was already there. I think that's really the point that you're making, uh, was that there was already Hewlett and Packard had already started their company and they had subcontractors who were doing circuit boards for them. So if you needed a circuit board for your, your new product, it, it was all mostly hardware oriented, of course, at that time. Uh, and so it was, how do you get something built with lots of subcontractors who could help you build a, a product? And, I think in Houston there were that well, that and there were wasn't so and there were that. lawyers who could help you with your intellectual yes, property, lawyers. and there were people who and knew publicity about publicity agents. In publicity, there was yeah. an ecosystem sort of floating around there that companies like ours and yours took advantage of. You didn't have to start all that from scratch. Exactly, exactly. So, it was much easier to start a company, I think, uh, in the in in that area than you would in in today and or not today, then in Houston. What made you decide in the mid 80s to sort of the IBM, Big Blue, was not a very popular company. I mean, it was kind of the, the I mean, every generation is the big evil yeah, company. In yes. the mid 80s, IBM is a big evil company. Yes, it was. Yeah, yeah, it was the computer company. Well, yes, it was evil, and, and yet it was respected for its marketing capability. They could sell. They could sell computers, the big computers. <laughs> and... They were the computer company, and of course, uh, the Justice Department was trying to break them up because they were so, you know, it's kind of like Google is today or, uh, or Facebook is today. They were filling a need, but uh, everybody thought they were just too large. And they did have some monopolistic tendencies, uh, as did AT&T, uh, also uh, the same sort of thing. Uh, so what happened was, uh, they they had successfully fought off uh, this attempt by uh, to break them up because clearly people were starting to do these mini computers and so clearly IBM wasn't the only game in town anymore so then IBM looked at the, they knew data was, they knew that data was going to be merged with telecommunications and so they wanted to be in the telecommunications business. And so they had, uh, they had partnered with a small Canadian company called Mitel uh, in, I want to say, 1972. And Mitel was building a similar product that we had, this computerized branch exchange, computerized switch. Uh, but nothing was happening. Mitel wasn't, they were, we didn't see them in the market. We were out selling them. They didn't have the right product. And so we, but we were concerned that IBM was this marketing behemoth and that if they wanted into our business, we were going to have trouble. And it looked like Mitel was their entree into our business. So we decided maybe we ought to go talk to IBM. So we went to IBM and we said, look, you don't want Mitel, you want Rome as your partner. And they agreed. And they bought 15% of our company. Uh, they put two people on our five-person board, so we still had control. Uh, and we were partners with IBM. We thought, well, this is great, right? There's, this is marketing giant, and we'll sell a lot of our equipment with IBM. Well, it didn't turn out quite so well. <laughs> and uh, for various reasons, we didn't. We didn't get along with IBM. Our, our culture was different than their culture and what have you. And so finally we said, look, this is not working. We, need, we want to buy back our shares. And they said, no, 
why don't we buy your company? And they, and they made us an offer we couldn't refuse, <laughs> as the saying goes. What, what you did not know was in 1985, I joined IBM. No, I didn't know that. <laughs> Otherwise, and, and that started the that's the downhill. Down. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I saw a couple of questions. One way in the back. Yes. You must have uh, overlapped with uh, Stanford Provost Terman. Yes. Uh, when you were in school, what impact did he have on you and your ultimate company? Well, I think he had a tremendous impact. He, he's <laughs> he's the starting of Silicon Valley. I mean, it was his idea to have this program where companies could send people who were qualified to be for to get a master's degree in engineering at Stanford and he and he said well to these various companies if you send us qualified people they can work they can study part time they don't have to be here at Stanford full time you can uh, 10 hours a week the program was you work you work 30 hours a week and you could study 10 hours, you could take 10 hours a week of courses at Stanford and, 30, and you got full pay and then, and they, and the company paid Stanford's tuition. In fact, they paid double tuition. Yes, Dr. double. Sale. Yeah. Terman said, look, you want to, you want to be in this program, you pay double tuition. <laughs> and it was tremendously successful. Hewlett Packard did it and you, you, you weren't, in, you weren't in the game in Silicon Valley unless you could offer that to your employees. Yeah, to, it, it was yeah. it was called Stanford TV, Stanford Instructional TV Network, and every little company, even ours, had a little antenna on the roof to get the signal from Stanford, and had a room full of TVs. It was yeah. it was it was the ante to be in the Silicon Valley. But it Valley was Terman's game. idea. Frederick Terman was the. But but he also the, he yeah. also went and recruited people like uh, Bill and Dave. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, they were his students. They, they were his the students. Packard, Hewlett and Packard were his students, and I, I think that's how he got the idea. Actually, is uh, seeing maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but I think yeah, th those guys both went off to like GE and Schenectady. They went east, and he said, "This is terrible. My best students are going east. What what formula do I put together in order to keep great people in California?" Yeah, and that was that yeah, was his I that was his plan. Right, right. So it's a good question. Uh, he, he was the father of Silicon Valley, really, in so my opinion. So you started yes. out doing defense, but at some point you switched to telecom. Did, did you become a pure telecom and defense sort of did it disappear? From no, no, we, had, we, we divided into two divisions. Oh, so okay. we, we maintained the, the military, and we did quite well, actually, in the military computers. We ended up, when we sold the company to IBM, we had uh, about... Uh, a hundred million dollars worth of uh, military computer sales and eight or nine hundred million in telecommunications. Uh, and then the Justice Department would not allow IBM to keep the military division because they were already in the military hardware, okay. computer hardware division, although it was totally different. I mean, mm -hmm. I think it was kind of the Justice Department getting back at <laughs> IBM because they had failed to yep. break them up. And so it was kind of like, well, you know, tit for tat kind of thing. Did IBM have to sell the Yeah, they had to divest the military division. They sold it to a local company, a Laurel, uh, in uh, uh, San Mateo, yeah, yeah. Close, close by. Yeah. So when you yeah. started, you said that uh, you had a patent when yes. the leadership and I'm going to start a company. Yes. What happened to the patent? Did oh, it, did it oh, ever play oh, a role? Oh, no, we didn't use that exactly. patent. Exactly. We <laughs> never used, No, no, I, we didn't uh, no, we never got the patent. Okay. We I was only in discussions with this fellow yeah. in San Diego and uh, and it was in our business plan, but it got cut out of the business plan. Mm -hmm. So, so we so started we, out the patent started the whole thing and the patent no, was irrelevant. No, no, yeah, we never we <laughs> never that was the vehicle location. The patent was uh, using uh, transmissions from uh, police radios so we can know, so the headquarters could locate where all our cars were. He had to get uh, fired first before he could start a company. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Of course, in order yes. To, um, I was curious to know what uh, what was the application of 
for the military computer that yes. was developed. What, and how did that differ? What was new that, that brought you into a, a marketable position? Oh, okay. Uh, basically, it was most it was data handling data, uh, and the data it typically, although uh, it was it was a general purpose computer because it was this mini it was a process control computer, so it could be used for anything. Uh, what the military needed it for was uh, intelligence for gathering data on what the other guy. This was the Cold War. We were worried about the Soviets, and so we were we were gathering uh, information on what what signals they were using for, for controlling their weapons, uh, for communications, and so what the what the what the military needed was something that would gather all this data, and we'd have you know use receivers to have the data come in, and then it would be processed by the by the computer. The Army was using it on Jeeps. It was also used for uh, uh, IBM, for uh, 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 counter, countering electronic signals for jamming. Uh, you know, at that point, uh, artillery shells had a fuse in them that had a radio signal that we detect when they were uh, about 100 meters off the ground and that explode at that point and that was pretty deadly uh, shrapnel. Well, they had a jammer that would detect this signal mm -hmm. and send a signal back and exploit the, the shell way before it hit, got anywhere near the ground. Uh, so this was a countermeasure. So the computer could calculate very quickly how to do that. Did you ever uh, wind up having an application into like the space program or NASA and that sort of thing? Uh, not so much in space because the computer was a little too big for that. Uh, but in, uh, in aircraft, uh, uh, for high, we were, could take very high vibration, high shock, very wide temperature range. So we'd go on Jeeps and, uh, and we were, uh, I think at one point we were on Air Force One uh, for communications uh, kinds of things. One more question. There we go. Two then. Two. Okay. <laughs> I'm around later if yeah. anybody. Scott and Don. Any questions we don't get? <laughs> yes. Trivially, I wonder if you were here when when we had Saturday classes, and did you ever run into Ken Pitts or when he went? Uh, yes, I was here for Saturday classes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> As was I a decade later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We still had Saturday classes. I don't remember Ken, no. Yeah. He was here when I was here and left and caused the Masterson yeah, I guess issue. I'm, I guess I'm older than he Yeah, is. he's old. Yeah. <laughs> Don, uh, what about Bert? When did he start his venture capital? I mean, relative to you. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, Bert was two years ahead of me right. at Rice. I knew him, uh, he and Dee Dee very well at, at, at Rice. Um, it was interesting. Bert was my boss at GT&E when I quit slash got fired. <laughs> he didn't fire me, but it was his boss that fired me. Uh, and what, had, what had happened is Bert, actually Bert was my boss's boss. And uh, when I was going to look for money, I went, I went to my boss, and he went to Bert. And Bert went to his boss and said, you've got to talk to the guy who runs the, the division. And this guy was a little, he was a little off. I mean, <laughs> not just because he fired me, but uh, whatever. Uh, but anyway, Bert, what's interesting was, uh, so I, I got fired, or I left, and uh, Bert was still there uh, at GT&E. Uh, we were starting this company, uh, and Ken and I, and the four of us starting this company, and Ken was still at GT&E. And by that time, uh, and Ken was there, and we were looking for money, and Jack Melkor was the guy and so Jack, uh, Ken knew that Bert knew Jack Melkor, and, he went, and so Ken Oshman went to, to Bert McMurtry and said, what about this guy, Jack Melkor? And 
What we didn't know is that Bert was thinking about joining Jack Melkor in venture capital. And, and Bert said, I can't say anything about Jack Melkor. I can't, I can't say a <laughs> word. Sounds like Bert. I mean, yeah, very, you know Bert. Yeah. You're very honest, the most honest guy you ever want to meet. And uh, it turned out that he left soon after we did. It w but he didn't, but uh, Melkor f funded the company and then he hired uh, Bert McMurtry to work for, for him and his venture capital company, and then Bert went on to do his own venture capital business. And he, at one, one point, he came on our board as Jack Melkor's representative for, that, for his fund. So, yeah, and Bert did very well, <laughs> as, as we all know. Well, um, can I ask a, a final you, question? You wanna yeah, nice. Wait, okay. <laughs> yeah. Silicon Valley, how has it changed over the years, in your view? I don't know. I, you know, I, I really kind of been kind of out of it for quite a few years now. So I think that's a question for you: uh, how it's changed over the years that you've been there. I mean, it, it's like I, one of the things I observed, but not. You know, I moved uh, away uh, not too long, ten years later. But the thing I would say is, for instance, I mentioned going public. In that, at that time period, to go to public, to go public, you had to show five, four or five years of increasing okay. sales, increasing profits. Nowadays, you can go public with just an idea. I mean, it's crazy. Right? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, if and if you, you can, lose enough money, you can go you public, can, right? <laughs> you can be the fourth dog food company and still go public. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. It's, it's, it's just a just whole different. Uh, and Silicon Valley, of course, you know, part of it's great because it's been, uh, they, uh, some of these companies have taken our ideas of a great place to work further with making it an even better place to work. But some's not so much. I, you know, I don't like the management. You know, Steve Jobs, as great a guy he was, I don't like his management style. I love Ken Oshman's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let, let me management let, style. Let me try to answer those. And being so totally, some of the companies are saying we're Steve Jobs. They, you know, they forgot about Ken Oshman, mm -hmm. and I, I started to see that. I, I think this being tough as a manager. Is a, is a terrible idea. I am in sort of a unique position, having stumbled out there in 1974, three years after the place first got named, <coughs> and never actually having been in a commercial company, but have been out there the whole time watching. Yeah. Okay. And there's actually a number of different shifts, some of which are good and some of which are bad. The number one thing is the place is just bigger. There's just so many more people. I mean, it's, it's sort of huge. hard to get around this yeah. huge mm -hmm. okay and what that meant is earlier it was a little bit because not just smaller but more people knew each other and yes. the ability of you to talk to Melkor and then to Bert and things got done a little bit quicker yes okay things were a little bit more technical okay if you had a technical story okay you needed to you needed to be able to make a little money but the, I guess the the a, a message I want to transmit to you is we talked about luck Okay, there's also uh, uh, the concept of risk, okay? And when you started a company back then, you actually knew that you were... It was this risky. Was, it was risky. This Very was not a certainty. And that you needed to actually possibly have a chance to do it a couple times because this one wasn't... Yeah, we got like, lucky. We got, we, we got, we got lucky. <laughs> and so you can't, happened, you can't yeah. emphasize that too much. <laughs> now, hard work is wonderful. Bob Maxfield always talks about we worked like crazy because we learned to work like crazy at Rice and we just did the same thing again. But there's luck, there's also the marketplace and so forth. Uh, but I, I do think that there's uh, the, this management style. Yeah, okay, we give everybody free lunch, but we're using that to bribe them to stay. That's sort of the Google model. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the leaders weren't fabulously rich back then and lived lifestyles that were unimaginable by normal people. They actually walked around and talked to their staffs. It's a, there's a yeah, sort of a, a shifting in how it works. Yeah. And I'm not saying it's bad or good, I'm just saying that it has evolved toward more industrial size kind of things than it was back then. So I think that was actually a good way to round out and, and we have a reception out. Well, let's thank uh, our, our good <laughs>